your opinion, what was the dominant dance and culture, genre, of the 1970s? That, that well, the what part of your 70s are you talking? I'm talking about from 74 on to like the early 80s. What was the dominant dance and dominant Ah, oh, the hustle. The hustle. Strictly. The hustle. You got to understand, what we were doing as B-boys and everything, that was an underground culture. I mean, it was what we were doing inside. That's why when all these people come with, well, this is not Brooklyn, this, that, and the other, uh-uh, uh-uh. That was very much a very, and I traveled to Brooklyn, Queens, because I have family in Queens. We, we did parties in Brooklyn. They weren't feeling what we were doing as far as B-boys and stuff were concerned. You know, they really weren't doing it. The dominant culture in dance as far as partying was the hustle, particularly the Latin hustle. As you know, we've talked about that. The Latin hustle, that led to the disco craze. You know what I mean? That led to the disco craze. You know, I, I, I was a dancer. I wasn't just a b-boy. I mean, I was a b-boy and I was real good at it and I'm well known at all that kind of stuff because you earned your reputation as an A1 b-boy and all that. But I was a dancer. I wore shoes too. I went to clubs. We talked about, remember, that Latin club, the Epoca, up there by Baychester Avenue near Co-op City. And I used to go there. They had all the little cute Latina chicks. And we used to dance and you could hustle. And, and, and you know, we liked women. You couldn't be a b-boy all the time. We liked women. And so, you know, you had girls who be girls and everything like that, but they were more harder kind of girls, especially when the burning went out and we went more to the floor, you saw less and less females. There were some, like my girl Trina T for the Zulu Queens, Taste, rest in peace, Kim Anderson. You saw some of that. Sha Rock, Sha Rock, who's MC Funk 4 plus one more. So we had some B girls, but as we went to the floor, you saw less and less of them because I guess it wasn't considered ladylike, you know what I mean? And we went to clubs, and the hustle was the dominant dance, and that's how you got girls. If you could hustle, women liked you, and I could hustle. You know, I could do my thing. And especially there was two types, like that Latin hustle is more of a smoother kind of thing. You know, somebody asked me once recently who my inspiration was dance-wise, and you wouldn't believe it, it's Fred Astaire. And Fred Astaire, the reason why, like you had cats like Gene Kelly, the Nicholas Brothers, Bill Bob and I love them. But they're much more athletic. It's a harder power type of a thing. My man Wiggles was just talking about that on, on, on Facebook. Fred Astaire had a style. He was smooth. He got the white tie, the tails style. on, and he's smooth. And you know, the spins, and you know, he could go power if he wanted to, but it was a finesse kind of thing. And so the Latin hustle had more of that finesse, and that's what I like. Like, they have a thing, the black hustle, the ghetto hustle. That's that, you know, that hard bop kind of thing. And, you know, that's cool, but that wasn't smooth enough for me. I like the, the Latin hustle, the Spanish hustle, was a smoother kind of a thing. And, you know, they had the songs about it. Dance to the Latin hustle. It was a different, it was a smoother kind of a thing. And that's what I like. Dude, exactly. Van McCoy, dude, hustle. And the Latin hustle is really what brought in the disco craze. Because, you know, once white people grab on it, then all of a sudden it's like, you know, that whole... 2001 Odyssey and Saturday Night Fever business. But cats have been doing that way before that. Way before that. We down in the Epoca, we down Bonds Casino, we're in the Stardust Ballroom. When we wasn't B-born, you know, I would go to other parties. And so the hustle was the dominant culture, without question. B-boy was an underground thing. That was an underground thing. Um, you know, one of the things that has happened, obviously, as you know, um, there's a lot of controversy regarding allegations against Africa Bambada, you know, who is a friend of mine, who I love dear. I mean, you know, good brother. Um, and obviously I'm very saddened by the allegations and things that he's dealing with. And I don't really want to get into that here. That's the topic for another story. But what it has done is created a dialogue that has um, provided those of us the opportunity to talk about the true timelines and, and to correct some of the misinformation, you know, about the beginnings of the Zulu Kings, the beginnings of what is known today as hip hop. You know, Bam and I have had that discussion, you know, when I was with him at the uh, last Zulu Nation anniversary. And I, and I asked, I said, Bam, you know, you gotta address a lot of these things that people are saying that you know are not true. And I have to say, Bam Bada himself is not the person who makes a lot of those claims. Although the date for the Zulu Nation is in era and he has to take responsibility for that. But the other stuff, it's not stuff that he says. I mean, they've said, like, he brought all the gangs together, he stopped all the gang violence in New York City, in the Bronx. That's just simply not true. You know, and I, I said that before, and got all kinds of flack from characters from all over the place. 
popping all kinds of bull crap. And you try to explain things to people in an in intellectual and educated way, and they still want to hear it. The gangs, the youth gangs of the Bronx of the 70s, we were just that. We were youth gangs. You know, we were teens. We were youth. And it died out. The Latin hustle culture, as you pointed out down here, when they start dancing and going to the clubs and the Latin hustle, that helped bring peace down here. The b-boy movement and what came to known as hip-hop brought a lot of, you know, peace to the black community. But Bam himself was not the person who brought an end to gang culture. And he never says he did. And it's unfortunate that, you know, it's taken all of this stuff that's going to actually bring this dialogue around. But, you know, it's, it's an important dialogue. We talked a lot about um, some of the early history of what came to be known as hip-hop. And more importantly, we talked a lot about the for lack of a better term, false information that people have put out. There's a lot of mythology around the beginnings of what came to be known as hip hop, uh, the beginnings of early b-boys, all those various kinds of things. Because I think it's really important for people who were there to tell the story as it happened. Because a lot of people are telling the story, one, a bunch of people who weren't around, so they really don't know anything. They're and, and someone is telling them something that is really not accurate. It's important for those of us, such as yourself, people like me, uh, Cool Herc, Flash, numerous other people who were around in the very beginnings, to tell the story of how this thing called hip hop really came into existence, the early days, the gang banging days. So this is really about telling people what the true history of B-Boys and the beginnings, and setting the timeline straight and what did and did not happen. And the style, what we like to call burning, you refer to it as rocking, right. you know what I mean? That's what was taking place late 60s, early 70s, before we started hitting the floor spinning around. That's right. You know, that wasn't occurring yet. And burning was more of a freestyle kind of a thing. It involved a lot of showing up the other person, embarrassing them, you know, you mush them in the face, you do all kinds of stuff. Right, right. A lot of style, a lot of comical stuff with it. All right, but we weren't hitting the floor yet. So you get a lot of people who are those early cats, like my man Dancing Doug, Dougie Cologne. I would say 1974, 75. I first saw it in 75. Um, they might have been doing it in 74, okay? But 73, it wasn't b-boying the way we know b-boying. Not that I saw, and I was around. It wasn't that kind of b -boy. It was the standing up, the pin drop, dropping back, maybe a split. You know, something you might see almost like on Soul Train, the locker dancer kind of thing. You see some of that. But the spinning on the floor and all those things that the modern B-boy, what, what you would recognize as the modern B-boy, that's not till around 1975 somewhere. The date that is used as the date of the Zulu Nation anniversary is actually November 12th, 1973. Now there's a lot of dispute with that. And I've talked to Bam about it. And Bam, uh, uh, as you know, Bam is going through his own thing right now, so we're not here to really talk about any of that. But, you know, I've talked with them about that before. And he has his own reasons for creating his date and what he actually said. He creates the date from the day that he conceived the idea. Okay? What I am telling you is that in 1973, we were still black space. We were very much still black space. And the Bronx River Organization, which is the pre predecessor to the Zulu Kings and the Zulu Nation, didn't begin, and this is by Bam Bada's own words, did not begin until the death of Solsky, Ronald Bethel, who was president of the 10th Division, the Bronx River. He was killed by the police, along with a number of the Black Spades, as well as a member who was our president, who was also shot in the same encounter, but survived. He was the only survivor. That occurred January 7th, 1975. Okay, so, just by that, and by what Bam has said and what anyone else has said, the Zulu Nation could not be in existence in 1973. So that's not to refute or anything. I'm just telling you what the, the chronological timeline just doesn't support that. Okay, and we were still Black Spades in 1973. And I would say the Zulu Kings, which actually precedes the Zulu Nation, because the Zulu Kings came, the Zulu Nation kind of came and resulted as a popularity because of the popularity of the Zulu Kings. So, late 75, maybe early 76, all right? The Bronx River Organization definitely could not have started until 1975 because it starts among the death of Soul School. And that is 1975. I can show you the newspaper articles. And we've already, we've talked about that. I've showed it to you. 
you know, and I know it very well because, like I said, our prez was the survivor. He was the lone survivor, okay? So that is something that I can say with absolute authority.